Welcome world, welcome to Unboxing Stories. I'm your host Tanmay Netke and I'm thrilled to have you with us on this incredible journey through our professional spotlight series. This podcast is all about diving deep into the lives of professionals just like you, ambitious, hard working and aiming for the stars. Whether you are just starting out or well on your way, these stories are your stories. Each episode will unbox the journeys of professionals from all walks of life. from everyday grind to those breakthrough moments our guests share experiences that everyone can relate to so buckle up get ready to laugh learn and be inspired this is unboxing stories professional spotlight series where every conversation is a journey worth taking Welcome everyone. This is my first episode and I'm very very excited. We have a very special guest today, a remarkable person. He's not just an average professional, but an exciting professional because he's a creative mind, knows a lot about multiple things. He can have a conversation about any topic you bring up. He's a proud father, a family man, and most importantly for me, he's a cherished friend and old friend. So, welcome Patrick May to my first episode. I'm very happy to have you and Let's get started. I must admit that was the nicest explanation of of who I am I've ever heard so uh thanks for that. I would have to say uh, you've nailed it um in terms of description. Yeah. I'm happy. I wanted to make you happy. I think I did. <laughs> I am. <laughs> First question, very important question. How has been the Dortmund season so far? So I, I since since I'm working in football I I always I've now two perspectives right one is the fan perspective and the other is the business perspective let's start with the fan disappointing obviously regarding the last season i think expectations are always high in dortmund and they don't don't match it when i look it from it from a from a business or analytical perspective i would say it's not that surprising to be honest i don't think the squad is really good and you have always troubles in in football especially when external and internal expectations are really high but don't match the 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 objective quality let's say um and i feel this is a kind of a situation currently in dortmund so but you are still enjoying watching them uh, i watch basically every game i don't watch it as often in the stadium uh, as i did earlier since family since since job but also i will watch it tomorrow Uh-huh. Yeah yeah so so I I'm I'm still uh I rarely miss a game I really rarely miss a game yeah Yeah I know and I I saw I think few days ago on LinkedIn you posted a picture where you as a kid were with your mom outside Signal Iduna Park that was very cute and that got me thinking actually because you have been your family even in fact your father your mother they have been very much into football coming up in Dortmund which is a crazy team crazy fan following my question is you think growing up in Dortmund in that kind of environment affected you somehow to go on this path of your career definitely i mean uh, that is i think what the, the podcast will also we will be about a little bit um we will unbox my story a little bit and i think for me football was always a way to connect with my father particularly since my father wasn't the best communicator in the world let's say um which is completely fine but that was always a way of non-verbal um communication and uh, on a very deep level so i i really um believe that there is a lot of yeah environmental reasons growing up reasons yeah, yeah the the reason i asked you this question because you have kind of unconventional path if we have to look at your story and let's start it unboxing right you were already into football going for matches you were also playing i know but then you suddenly decide study chemistry and then not just study it but study it at the highest level possible you go for a phd also with a great professor cheers to professor ulbrich by the way so one of the well known membrane research groups in the world and you decide to do that and then you suddenly take a sharp turn so quite few things to unbox here let's go back and i would like to ask you for you had all this passion for football why chemistry then yeah i mean to get a career in sports is not very easy right so even if you study sports 
not guaranteed so it was never never really in my mind i i mean you develop your interest in puberty right i always was interested in almost everything i i like to explain things i think chemistry catched me because i mean it's about the fundamental particles of matter right so i was always i think already unconsciously interested in the question what is the world made of I, I actually I, I don't believe it's act, I think it's still made of matter but I think more fundamentally and more importantly it's made out of stories we can come back to that later on but I think that that question actually drove me to chemistry so yeah that was basically the 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 main interest my my curiosity to to understand the world I would say Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I want to know two things. One, what made you make this jump? Okay, let's let's do the PhD and then figure it out. And second question is, if there is someone else out there who is on the borderline of deciding, okay, do I need to do a PhD? What is it going to do for me? What value is going to add for me? What advice would you give from your experience? Yeah, so a uh, great great questions. To be honest, I don't think I had a clear intention going into the PhD. It was more like okay, once you have your masters and you are good and you don't know what else you should do, just do your PhD. Looking back on this, I think there was a lot of ingratitude in that situation because doing your PhD is actually a, a huge privilege. So I would love, I, I, I realized it like in the, in the midtime of the PhD time, but I think it would made it everything easier if I, if I have realized that uh, prior to that. So uh, honestly, uh, there was no, no clear intention. It was more like, what else should I do now? So you just keep on going. And it was never like too hard for me. So it was, it, it wasn't like I was, um super tired because i was working my my uh a off or so right i know what, uh, because for me as well when i did my phd i didn't know what i was going to do after phd right but the journey itself was quite exciting and i looking back i i think yeah this is something that i needed at that point in my career exactly so um that would be the the story part again of that um looking back on it and and having this decision really at mid time to take responsibility for my decision which i didn't before i i made an unconscious decision i i made no decision and that was the issue but once you realize okay do i want to do this or not uh-huh. and if you ask this question you can answer both ways both is fine you, there is no right or wrong answer here but you have to answer it in one way and that was definitely one big big part in my professional career i would say to take responsibilities for my decisions mm-hmm. and get away from like kind of like an unconscious victim or or like like wavering around with no intentions in life i think that is something i really realized in the in the phd journey yeah so you you were more of okay now i have decided that i'm going to do this there's no looking back there's no doubting what i have decided i'm just going to do it and that's it and that freed my my i think it freed like let's let's use an uh, chemical uh, or physical uh, uh, concept entropy right um entropy is like like chaos and and fr- freedom in a sense too much of that in a in a psychological sense um, is over over uh, loading and once you decide like the path is clear and then everything also becomes much more smooth for your own career right so i think that was the real benefit of the phd even though i think chemistry will at one point in my life get me back i i, I have that feeling to be honest but it, it, not 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 in the next years what about advice for people who are on the of the border thinking about is it is phd for me because i i come across a lot of people who who ask me this question right since my career went completely different it depends a little bit on your intentions for example if your intention is to have a like a universal key in the business atmosphere i would say it's always good to get a phd right because it opens doors it is like a universal key working for many many different doors so if that is an intention to be flexible and and have a, a very broad possibilities of career choices think that is a great reason and was one definitely for me as well i guess the second could be just 
the and I think that is actually the best curiosity of, of investigating, right? Not getting something out of it after you've done it, but getting something out of it because you do it, yeah, no. enjoying the process, right? And and because we are, I think it is a recent and modern phenomena. We always do something because we want to get something. That's normal, obviously, right? But there is also this this idea of you you do something because you enjoy it, right? And I think this passion, this curiosity is actually the best marker if you should do it. And then, of course, also the level of stress you can adapt to, right? I mean, not just the workload, which can be high, but doesn't have to be, but can be high, but also in a sense of stress, right? Because uh, you remember, it, you have to manage your doubts, your fears, your anxiety, which is okay, which is completely fine if you have them. But it, it's definitely something that, that one should be aware of. Yeah. What was your favorite part of doing your PhD and the most hated part of doing your PhD? Uh, writing was the best one. I love writing. I, I, I still write. So until this day, I, I write articles or, or correct articles for friends, whatever. I, I That was my favorite part. Yes, to that, because that helped me when I started writing. And I remember we had a call about this because writing is something people procrastinate forever. And especially, yes. I mean, in Germany, you are kind of flexible as to whenever you want to write, you can take as long as you want and then you submit. It's not fixed like US or let's say also in Asia where you have this time and you have to do it. There's no other option. And it's an advantage, a disadvantage at the same time. Yeah, yeah, I think I think even Professor was in the end surprised uh, how well the writing went. So, so uh, he was he was very happy. Uh, uh, so, so he he changed the entire story of my PhD after he saw what I was writing because that part was the last one. So I made kind of a good last impression in that in that regard. If you want to share maybe briefly your writing process, I think that will be very, very interesting for people to know who are into writing, but can't really get anything on paper. Yeah, I think I, the first thing I, what which I did was like read three books about writing. That was the most important thing. And um, so I prepared. And what I what I realized was basically this. the The brain works in two different modes. One is precise, analytical, very specific, critical, and the other is open, flexible, uh, idea generating. People have different strengths, right? That's that's personality. But it, in order to write well, you have to separate the writing process also into these two categories. So one would be write without any constraints you don't have to write the words correct you don't have to write the sentences correct um, it's just getting the gist out of your brain for example it's just generating the idea don't matter how bad it is and the second part is then correcting that into correct sentences and splitting that not doing both at the same time is the game changer because then you don't sit 10 hours in front of your screen and get like 500 words done but you rather like what i did two hours generating stuff so it was like 700 words and then minimize it to three four hundred correcting it usually correcting is reducing words uh, in one hour and i was done after three hours and i knew that what i have written was actually already really well you can iterate then the process, right? But separating these two modes is, is, is it will be always frustrating if you don't do it, if you don't separate it. Right. As, as they say, right, good writing is editing, basically. Exactly, exactly. And the first writing is just writing. It's just no constraints. Nobody will read it. It doesn't matter, right? So so use really the, the openness of the process. There was There are then different techniques for that. The one is called free writing. You can open a document, and if you don't know what to write, you should write, I'm so stupid, I don't know what to write, blah, 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 blah. Everything is, is gone. I will never do my PhD. All my thoughts are so stupid. I'm crazy. You do it for five minutes, all the trash is gone, and then you can go back. So there are different methods. The, the, the global view would be separating these two brain modes. And, and maybe one other thing I, I would like to share is you can... Calculate the average number of words a PhD has, like from the past 20 
PhD candidates. So you have an average number and then you can divide it with like, say, half a year or a year. And then you know the number of words you should write each day. Usually it's not that high, to be honest. And then you can have like a progress bar. You can you can create a super easy Excel, which like, okay, if I do this, I'm in a half a year, I'm done. So that's great. And so you see progress as well, because otherwise it becomes this, this uh, monster without uh, edges. And then you're like, oh, oh okay, it's 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 contained. Yeah, yeah. You you mentioned that PhD also would help people to broaden their future opportunities. I have a slightly different take to that. I think some people would argue that maybe doing a PhD, for example, in your case where you did your PhD in polymer chemistry, so nothing to do with what you're doing right now. And then you you suddenly make this sharp turn. So you go into sales with Metler Toledo first and yes. then move to Goal Impact where you are right now, but you start as also sales marketing guy and now you're head of business development. I would like to come back to this first job where you study chemistry, do a PhD and then make this turn. A lot of people will argue it would narrow down, but in your case it didn't. But I'm, And I'm sure you must have faced a lot of challenges in making this happen. So I just would like to know how this journey took place. Yes, so that's actually a quite valid point. So the first job, to get the first job is really the hardest thing. And I would say one should never have too high um, ideals here. The ideal should be to get expertise. Right. So to get some experience. That That is actually what the first job is all about. It's not about money. It's not about uh, the perfect job. It's about getting into the industry if you want to stay in the industry, but let's let's stick for that. And then just just get some experience learn how the industry works because it's not the ivory tower you've ever been in and you've been protected because you've never had to to i mean you know you know how academia is right so i think the the ideal version of the first job has to has to change and then then it broadens. So it's like the first thing is really narrow. But then afterwards, if you have proven yourself in industry and get some experience, then it broadens quite quickly, to be honest. And how challenging was it for you? Super challenging. It was uh, COVID time. Julia was pregnant. Yeah. I was writing still the thesis. So it was like transition mode. I wasn't paid by university anymore. Right. So there was a lot of pressure. And then I was on the Camino, so like um, pilgr pilgrimage. Yeah. And on one of the last days, I get a, uh, I, I received a yes from a job, which wasn't Metler to later, was prior to that, where I was with Econity, also sales, also a startup, but it was through actually network. So through an old colleague. So also that here, network is everything in, 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 in jobs. In the past, I always said, ah, that's, I don't like I think that's not fair but I I changed my mind about that because if somebody says something good about you at a different company it is actually a valuable credit here. Right. So he's right. giving his word, right? So and that's that's quite a lot so. Very very good point you bring because I think value of networking and what I mean by networking is not just posting something online or you have connections on LinkedIn networking is actually going out there in person making genuine connections being interested in other people and doing good work and then you have this word of mouth publicity someone else is talking about a sales shop somewhere else and they ah, i know a guy Patrick, he did quite good in so and so company and i think people underestimate it but yeah. a huge power and as you said it it plays a big role in in job search and in later part of your career absolutely and also here Look, the most important aspect of human reality is actually social reality. So who whom you are connected with. And, and again, not these shallow connections because you're on, on LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever, but such connections like we have. If in five years, Tanmay, if there is a situation in which I not doing well or you are not doing well, and we ask each other because that's important. You have to still ask. You have to go into the unknown and be perhaps uncomfortable. You you ask then somebody, 
they will remember. I remember how you came first in first week and we watched, I, I showed you like a documentary, I think it was, uh, or a TED talk about Bhutan, a country in, in uh, Southeast Asia. I will remember that. And, and these connections, right, they, they stretch over time. And that's what really also our wealth is actually all about. Because, because I'm connected with you, I have another door of op opportunities by you. Well said, very well said. And what advice would you give to someone who wants to create these connections? Because it's not like, oh, let's connect and it happens. It takes time. You need certain skills as well. You need certain character. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, of course, there are people more introvert than, than we are, perhaps. But uh, you still have to get out of your comfort zone in a, in a sense here. And also, there, there is actually nothing greater in sharing emotions with other people. Yeah. I think we've lost that art a bit. Friendship, right? We had, we talk about. I, I think the coach coaching industry actually is uh, a lack of friendship. So that just just a side note. A every coach on uh, uh, this planet will hate me now. No, no, I, I'm not that dogmatic, but I, I'm just just generalizing. But just just being again human in a sense, right? Sharing things, laughing, asking for help because usually people are very eager to help you if you ask them also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will come back to what you said before. You do your PhD and I think the expectation after you do your PhD is that, oh, now I have my PhD. Now I need an amazing job because I did so much. I deserve something better. People create this idea, but what you said is, is absolutely right. Your first job is something for learning, getting exposure. It's the first step that you're taking. So if you try to jump too high, you will fall down. So um, I would I would always say also a stress test from the industry in a sense. So in in that way that why be only because you have a theory you think you can survive in the practical world like like in a sense don't don't be too sure about your competence mm -hmm. here because in academia you're you're just purely theoretical. Chemistry is maybe a difference, but application into the real world is always a different animal, right? Let's talk about goal impact. Let's get into it. For people who don't know what goal impact is, can you please explain what, what is goal impact and what's your role in goal impact in making it a successful venture? So goal impact is a, a player, a football player rating um, algorithm. So it rates players, like in a sense like FIFA, 90, 80, whatever. But we don't have limits like 0 to 100, but it's, it's rating players. We claim that it's rating them objectively. Why? Because we measure the correlation between playing time of a player and his influence on the score. Mm -hmm. And since this is the only goal of a game, right? So it's the only aim is to win a game and then to influence the, the, the goal difference positively. We claim we can objectively determine if somebody is good or bad. Of course, there are some tricks in the algorithm, but that's more or less what, what we do. I, I was looking at your website and it's, it's been a very interesting story. I think the founder, your, he, he started it back in 2004, where he was betting with his friends and it's it's evolved quite a bit. And I, I saw some interesting names there. Kai Havertz, Alfonso Davis, William Brandt. So very, very interesting stuff that you're doing. Any any young talents that you you are especially interested in? I could so you mean some which are not yet discovered that much? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure that you're helping scouts, you're helping teams to identify such talents which are probably not on the radar of these big algorithms or, or the traditional way of scouting players. So I, I was just curious if, if there is someone out there that you want to highlight probably that watch out for this guy. Okay, then I tell you somebody from the second, second league because that's perhaps more interesting. Right. I think I remember this guy who was like... What was his name? Troy Troy Parrott, I think, from Tottenham, second Tottenham team. Super underrated guy. I don't know what what is his market value right now. Four million, it says. So yeah, I think this guy is actually really underrated. But he he was 
always on loan so he's always like transferred but for us he would be extremely underrated yeah i know that he's excellent but is not recognized by the market which brings me to the most fundamental point we are making and this is the market is super inefficient in football <laughs> it's very very interesting i mean i mean the scouting industry and in general scouting of the players it has been done for a long long time i'm sure now you as a head of business development what's what's your vision for goal impact how do you see it growing and what are the major challenges yes so so let's 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 go back to the history of scouting maybe so <laughs> How was scouting initially? I mean, you you go to games, we watch them, right? And then somebody pops up and then you're like, oh, this guy is good. So then comes the internet. So you get video material. Then you can scout players basically from all over the world or, or di- you don't have to travel that much, but you can just watch, watch snippets, right? Changes. Then comes like since 10 years or so, the data revolution in football as well. You measure passing percentages, where the ball is put in, tech, tackling uh, percentage, all these things. I mean, that's that's very simplistic. There are more sophisticated uh, KPIs right now, but that tells you a little bit more from a data perspective what is a, what the player does. And this is the current state, I would say. I think almost every club does data scouting as well right now. What we say is, um, okay, you can describe a player and it's important to know how a player plays with data, but it's not necessarily um, that this player is then still good because football overall for us is a complex system, meaning you have 5 million actions on the game and each influence each other. So it's not that easy from a bottom-up perspective. So with with these these data approaches to say if a player is good, you just can actually describe how a player plays. And what we do is the complete reverse. We say in a complex system, you don't know why somebody is good, but you can measure if he influ- in in which way does he influence the complex system from a from a, a score perspective. And as you can imagine, this is very very different than what is done and also if i look at my entire database i see how inefficient the market is Mm -hmm. so if we become successful we will change the market very dramatically to be honest so we we measure not just win percentage but really the goal difference so let's say the idea comes a little bit from basketball where you which is where it is easier but you measured what happens if a player is exchanged to the uh, point difference between the teams mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. with a lot of changes and a lot of points you get a lot of uh, you you can extract signal from noise statistically and then you know which player does uh, influence the, the the score. And football, it's much, much more complicated, much, much more complicated due to various reasons. But the idea is quite similar. Yeah, That's quite interesting. So I, I really like your vision and it's quite powerful to change completely the scouting market and what it's based on. And that's, that's going to be a tough job. And I, I'm just trying to understand from you what, what are the challenges in, in convincing people about this? Yes, uh, and and one the main challenge is if I I talk to you now and I present it as this revolution, game is lost. So I have to in my communication, add um, uh, show more like you can, and it and it is like that because you would never buy a player just because his number or rating is high. That's stupid, right? You need to still know how he plays. So that's that's always uh, an important factor. But it's more like. Okay, you have answered um, from data perspective how he plays. You've watched videos, but you can also then have an objective rating. So the additional information from a different perspective adds improvement in decision making in transfers. So overall, it's always about improving the decisions, right? Because every transfer or, or signing is a bet. Yeah. And the more different perspectives you can get, it's not about getting the same uh, perspective. So it's not about like asking five scouts or whatever, but really different perspectives like traditional scouting, data scouting, and our objective perspective. All these combined add really uh, right. the value. Um, but of course, one of our claims is, for example, um, that there are a couple of players in German fourth league 
which we would definitely see in Bundesliga. Yeah. Um, definitely. So we can really point them to which league they would, would match. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And of course, we come across as heretics, particularly if Jörg is a physicist and has no deal with football, and I'm a chemist and not coming from the industry. So you can imagine the, the heretics mix up the, uh, the, the, the football world, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I can imagine it's 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 going to be a challenge. But I, I I see that both of you seem very passionate about this, and I, I can only wish you good luck. No, I'm I'm quite optimistic because we have now found a way how to leverage it. I would say because it's it's more like how do you get started? Who 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 is the first one who trusts? And then you ask, okay, who's the first one who would win of that? And the players from the lower leagues yeah. are the ones. So this is what we leverage right now. Um, and once I think the boat is, is um, going, it will become much more easily because then you have um, like network effects in the, in the usage, right? And then everything becomes easier. So most of the projects I imagine are a collaboration project, right? Yeah, yeah. So there are different uh, interest groups. Um, of course, players and their agents uh, are one one uh, group. But uh, of course, the coaches are also interested. But we will also rate the coaches in the summer probably, and uh, then of course the scouts. And and actually, actually, but this this group is um, usually hardest to reach is the board because the board is controlling, right? And if we have an objective number, it could be used or it is used as a controlling tool um, by the board member in order to know if they should spend money on, on a certain player, right? Right, right, right. What you are doing can be expanded to other sports areas or can be expanded maybe also outside of sports. Have you thought about this? Uh, I mean, it's it's basically a risk analysis uh, aspect, which or or like empirical. It's it's basically measuring empirical reality. I would say so. It is used by by Jörg in 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 uh, his his main job, um, or the idea is similarly used in his uh, algorithmic trading with Vattenfall, for example. So it's about describing the world and predicting the world and if you do it better you have an edge so uh, it can be it can be transferred to sports of course uh, actually the more goals and ch uh, changes in a game happen the easier it becomes um, so I think initially it was really uh, basketball where it happened but I think it should be super simply uh, transferable to handball or or uh, I don't know, ice hockey, whatever. I, I guess even perhaps the simpler score um, is already used there. Uh -huh. And is it, I guess also for not just team sports, also individual sports, right? Is it more complicated there? I think in chess, which is what Jörg started with uh, implementing in, in football, uh, was this ELO rating. And this is what, what uh, chess all is about. And I think you can implement it on different sports as well, yeah. Very, very interesting. Yeah, I learned quite a lot about something and not. You clearly are very, very passionate about what you do. But at the same time, you, you have your family as head of business development where it's already challenging. You must have be taking a lot of time for your work. And then you also have to handle your private life. So how do you, how is it working for you? What system do you have in place? What would you like to improve? So Sunday is really like non-negotiable for me. It became like this day where I don't don't like to to have work things on my mind. I really don't want to. And and if you stick to it, it you get used to it very fast. I was because that's my nature. Sometimes too extreme. I, I turned even my phone off sometimes Sunday. I still do it, but if I want to chat with friends, I chat with friends. So I'm not that uh, dogmatic here anymore, but I try to have like one day in which really I, I, I don't think about work no. and uh, it works quite well. Then I would say uh, another thing is if I don't need my phone, I leave it at home. That is also quite a good thing. So, I mean, if I go at six somewhere for two hours and I know you won't need your phone because your wife has a phone if you need to call someone. 
then you can leave it at home. So something like that. So just leaving it somewhere else. And then, uh, of course, you need to have patients or, or patient family members, which I have, which is good. I think that's quite important. Certain instances, because of the stress, you, you're not really yourself. You you kind of behave in a different way because of the other things that are happening at work. And if you have your family, your partner who are accommodating, considerate about the whole situation that you're going through and more patient, as you said, that, that really yeah. makes you stronger to tackle the problem. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think the main issue is in an interconnected digital world is you can work from everywhere at every time, which is great, but you can work from everywhere at any time, which is bad. You ne you, ca you can work nonstop and this is a huge issue and so you have to manage that in a way. I was more strict, I remember um, when I was PhD, I mean, you you are more flexible because you're on your own but i remember i i came later on at 10 30 to work and prior to that i was just reading and doing like mm -hmm. some sports which was super great now it's more like okay till nine i i try to not not be too early on uh digital uh life i see depends you try to bring in more discipline and stick to it and it becomes a habit then and and i think then that also reflects on who you are as a person because as you said if people start knowing that oh patrick doesn't work on sunday so they stop assuming that patrick will do it on the weekend because why not right so they they know okay yeah. patrick doesn't work on weekends no we can't ask him yeah 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 i think borders are important and people respect that to be honest um i mean sunday i think something that nobody should ask you if you should work on sunday i think that's that's even a transgression from from the side you can make you can make always sacrifices in terms of importance it's always possible but it should never be a, a rule right but yeah everyone has to find um their own way i think i found my way I often take like small meditation uh, gaps in between like five to 10 minutes um, when I know, okay, I have a short window, then I close my eyes and, and meditate or so. Yeah. And the funny thing is, I think, I think I'm meditating now for 10 years, more or less, maybe, maybe it's eight. I, I think it just started right now that it helps me. Ah. Like, I think it took eight years yeah. of like, almost daily really almost daily i had different methods i uh, so different ways but it took almost eight years i think until it's kicking in right right crazy exponential growth which is which is another huge principle in my life i i try always to think exponentially like think what what could happen in seven years not in like seven weeks yeah but i think a lot of very very successful people that's what they have right they have the vision they they don't think about two years five years 10 years 20 years they're thinking ahead of everyone else and that's yeah, yeah. yeah sign of a very very successful person i have been observing your journey it has been challenging so far but i'm sure there have been instances where you feel defeated every day every day almost every day what do you do? Do you do self-coaching? Do you have a mentor that you talk to? Is how, how does it work? Because once you feel that, you need either your own thoughts to pick you up from there and get going, or you need some help because at sometimes let's accept it. You need to talk to someone. How how do you do that? So I think friends, as I said, friends are better coaches. If you have friends, uh, you're much better off because you can share your your thoughts, fears, joys, whatever, um, which is a big part of, of just emotional uh, management. Then I would say I am a huge, pick your word, philosophical, spiritual, religious, pick your word, which, which, whichever word doesn't trigger something in you. Yeah. This, this one, but I'm a huge person here um, in that regard that we need to create, we need to have some meaning in our lives this balances me very much and uh, for me personally I, i'm like this person 
I don't like authorities. I'm my own, my own authority. So mm -hmm. I would never pick a mentor because I need it. I think I would always self-coach myself in that regard. Um, but it could be for somebody else who is like more like open that for them a mentoring could be very, very um, useful. It's not that you don't want a mentor because you already have this support system of your friends, your family around that you don't see the need to go to a stranger who could help you out because you have people who you trust and they know you better than the stranger. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and I think this this was actually until 20 years, it was the, the regularity. We've just created these shallow connections and have lost the art of deep connections and friendship, which is very bad from a, uh, I don't want to say bad, it's, it is as it is, but I think there are huge risk in this isolation um, bubble we are, we are seeing right now. I mean, for the first time in the history of humankind, I think the probability of, of being alone is higher than the probability of being with somebody else, which is kind of crazy and for many reasons right and it's it's a pandemic in itself exactly exactly and 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 look we can talk about covid and and it's complicated or, or complex actually but i think there was never the discussion okay isolation has impacts on the immune system yeah we never talked about these things and and this is what what brings me back to what i said early on um, we are social animals we are the most social animal. Humans, look look around your 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 flat. You see like I don't know like super expensive stuff around and 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 fancy stuff. It's only possible through collaboration, right? So through collaboration, we be, we became this 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 crazy species, this super wealthy species. We miss that right now. But um, on the other side. If you are, are alone from a tribal perspective or evolutionary perspective, if you have been alone, that was almost like a death sentence. Yeah. Literally. You would never survive in the savannah or in the jungle or whatever alone. You cannot do it. Together, you are strong. Alone, together, humans are actually the strongest. Alone, hu humans are super weak, super weak. And we are reversing this evolutionary logic. A little bit. We still are cooperating, right? Moving on, I know you are a fan of books. What are top three books that kind of influenced you or shaped you? I usually ask, answer this always with what I'm currently reading, which is a bias. So I, I have to think for about that for, for a second. I think all Nassim Taleb books, I think he, he made me see the world very, very differently. Oh. Um, in that regard, that randomness might be good. Um, that organic system profit from uncertainty in a certain degree. All these things. So that was like a huge opener. And I, I loved the writing style uh, as well. I think the Bible is a fantastic book if you read it from a different perspective. But also the Bhagavad Gita. I haven't read the Quran, so I cannot say anything about that. But I assume it's similar. I, I know that it's it has passages also from the Bible. So let's let's put it in that category. And then which book? Ah, I love Atomic Habits. Simple, I mean quite known, but super good book. Just just a tremendously valuable book which um, allows you to change your your uh, life very mm -hmm. very pragmatically no yeah pragmatic is the right word things that you can implement immediately once you read so the series is called professional spotlight where we unbox stories of professionals successful professionals like yourself with various backgrounds try to learn and get inspired from the stories right so we are coming to the end i have one question for you which i would like to ask every guest that we have what's one moment or opportunity in your career where you truly felt like you were in the spotlight and that kind of influenced you in in professionally in changing your trajectory or perspective about your career does this moment exist or you are waiting for this moment to happen I have I have a couple of memories. I remember um, the PhD day was really like a lot of stones just just disappeared from from the heart. I remember 
the first time I was at a professional German club and talking to the to the uh, people who decide that was that was definitely special you, because then you're reminded of your childhood right that you just 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 loved loved the sports and and it's kind of miraculous where you are right now so that would be the career moments i guess there are a couple of more right i i told you the pilgrimage the last day or the the, the second last day and then you get the job so the, these moments and from a career perspective these are the moments where i think the psyche has this this it is shortly disorganized but in a good sense that it it's it remembers as if there was a story already planned for you yeah yeah yeah, yeah. destiny idea of destiny let's call it right where you where you have this moment where you just sit there you don't really care what's happening around but you just and you're in the moment and you feel like aha uh-huh, aha uh-huh, this is the aha uh-huh moment yeah. Nah. Yeah, 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 and and you couldn't have planned it. Yeah, it just happens to you. It's right. a gift in a sense. Right, right. Before we leave, I want to just get it out there. What? How can people learn more about you? What you do? About your company? Where they can find you? Connect with you? Yeah, I mean, Google is the first uh, thing. Uh, I think if you Google my name. Um, there will appear a couple of things in which you can easily connect with me. I usually answer uh, if it's interesting. <laughs> no, I mean, um, you can answer, you can Google Goal Impact as well, so you will find the company. I'm very, ha- uh, I-, I like to help as well. So that's that's why I say if somebody wants to reach out and, and ask for something, I'm very, very happy. But Google Google is the best uh, solution, I would say. Perfect. Thanks a lot for being gracious with your time and really opening your heart to all the questions. I think we unboxed the story quite well. It was very much enjoyable for me. I I hope also for you. And yeah, it was really fun. I I really enjoyed it and thank you very much. Same here and uh, thanks for the invitation, Amit. Of course, of course. And that's a wrap for this episode of Unboxing Stories Professional Spotlight Series. I hope you found today's discussion as inspiring and insightful as I did. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, rate, and leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. Your feedback keeps our passion alive and helps us reach more incredible listeners like you. Thanks for listening. I'm Tanmay Nate K. And I look forward to having you join us again for our next episode where we will feature another fascinating professional. Until then, keep striving, keep thriving, and keep unboxing your story. Goodbye.